Good evening, my dear sisters and brothers. A very warm welcome once again to yet another session on the law of the teaching, a uh, law of the church. These evenings we have been spending time listening to various speakers tell us about our faith. If you jog your memory back last week, last Thursday to be precise, we had a session on this topic of canon law on the sacraments we began last week and we spoke about the sacraments of Christian initiation. We spoke of three sacraments, baptism, confirmation and holy Eucharist, the mass as some people may call it. And we realized, my dear sisters, all these sacraments are moments of special grace. When we spoke about this sacrament last week, we said that a sacrament is an external action, something that a priest does through the rite of the church, by which we receive God's inward grace into our lives. All the seven sacraments, my dear friends, have this basic theology, the teaching of the church. That something done externally, an external act which gives us inward grace, the grace of God. So three sacraments we have covered. This evening, my dear friends, I'd like to focus on two very essential and very, very important sacrament for us. These two sacraments are called the sacraments of forgiveness and of healing. As a test, my dear friends, I sent out a few messages to some of my friends and acquaintances. I'd like to speak first about the sacrament of penance. And I was very touched by the number of responses and the type of responses I got to this very beautiful sacrament of penance, what is otherwise called confession. Sometimes it's also called the sacrament of reconciliation. What was very heartening that the majority of you, my dear friends, those who responded, were very happy to go to the sacrament of penance or confession. Surely you had some reservations, some doubts, some concerns. And yet for me as a priest, it was so nice to know what really people think on a personal level about the sacrament of confession. Since Vatican II, that is sometime in the late 60s, the church has renewed itself in its understanding of its own self as well as about the sacramental life. And going back to Vatican II, soon after that, Pope Paul VI, in December of 1973, gave us a way of understanding how we can celebrate the sacraments in order to enrich our whole relationship with God and the Church. The basic theology of why we go for confession does not change. But he gave us three different rites by which we can go to the sacrament of confession. Before I come to that, my dear friends, we ask ourselves, what is the reason people need to go for the sacrament of penance? What really does the sacrament of penance do? Why do people have to go or why do people choose to go for the sacrament of penance? In listening to some of these responses, I was touched by the very personal manner of sharing. Father, it has touched my life. I am a renewed person. Every time I go there, I see myself in a newer light. I believe that I cannot die in sin. I know that I need to renew my relationship with God and with my neighbors. So these type of responses is what I got to understand from our lay people, from you, my dear friends, as to why you would want to go for the sacrament of penance. So Vatican II constantly kept giving us a renewed understanding of the reason why we should go to the sacrament of penance. The Catechism of the Catholic Church very beautifully says that it is God who is the one who invites us into a sacrament. God invites us. The act of forgiveness, my dear friends, is not the act of a priest. I'll speak about that as I uh, uh, relate with you about the teaching of the church in the law. What is the role of the priest? What does he really do there? What is his part in that sacrament? So we believe that in the theology, the teaching of the church, that it is God who forgives. So God calls us into that relationship of forgiveness. Yes, we will read of what the church law says, when you can go, how you do, all that we will learn. 
But the very reason why we go, my dear friends, is to understand that it is God who forgives sin. Pope Paul, John Paul II of happy memory, he had beautifully once stated that our generation today has lost a sense of sin. It is not that one does not realize something is wrong, but rather to see that wrong as being sinful is something that our humanity today, our civilization today is tending to forget. And so therefore, my dear friends, this whole session is not just to tell you what the law says, what you can do, what you can't do, but is to also invite you, for those of you who struggle as to why should I go for confession, why can't I talk to God directly, why do I need a mediator, it is also for you to understand and renew your understanding whether you would like to come to receive, as I said, every sacrament being a moment of grace where God enters our life and does something very special to us. So coming now to the sacrament of penance, confession. The church law says, my dear friends, that there are three possibilities in the code of canon law. It gives us three possibilities how we can do our sacrament of penance. And I'm sure two of these you have already seen possibly in the way you have related with your church. The one is the most familiar one. That means I go to the church, I see a priest in the confessional or I make my appointment with the priest and I make my confession. So it's a one-on-one -on -one confessional. The second possibility is we'll see sometimes in the season of Lent or in Advent or sometimes during the course of the year or in places of pilgrimage where they call a whole community of people who would want to feel reconciled with God in the church. The priest conducts a community service leads the penitents over there to prepare themselves for the sacrament of confession and then each one comes personally, confesses his or her sin and receives the absolution in the sacrament. These are the two ordinary forms the church law says that one can experience and I am sure at some time you have done that. The third one is what they call the extraordinary form. That means in terms of emergencies or when the bishop permits a priest at some time because of some exigencies, there is a possibility the church gives the possibility to a whole community to make the act of penance, sacrament of reconciliation and get what you call a general absolution with the thought and with the fact of the matter that they will go at some time and make their act of confession. So three rites are envisaged in the teaching of the church in the law. The sacrament of penance, my dear friends, as the church law would tell us, requires fourfold element. The first element being there should be contrition in the heart. That when one comes to the sacrament of penance, there must be a deep sorrow. So you come there because you feel sorry for your sin. You don't come there because, as somebody would say, I've been told from childhood, everybody is going for confession. My parents have told me or because I'm going to get married or because I'm going to receive sacrament of confirmation. So sometimes these are reasons why people would come. But in fact, the church law will tell us you must have sorrow in your heart. The second element is the very nature and the fact of making your confession. That means saying your sins, talking to God in the confessional, telling him your problems. Thirdly, is a priest giving what they call penance. Penance would mean the priest asking you to make some sacrifices, do some charity, say a few prayers. Various types of penances are given in the church by the priest. And fourthly is the absolution. The priest by a formula which I will give you at the end, what the priest says in the confessional, completes the act of confession. So once again, it requires a deep contrition, sorrow in the heart. Secondly, is to confess verbally the sin. Thirdly, the priest will give you some penance and fourthly, the priest will give you absolution. With these four elements, my dear friends, the sacrament of penance becomes complete. So while the sacrament asks you to come and present yourself and your sins to God, the manner of these four elements given by the church completes the act of the sacrament of penance. Who is the minister of this sacrament? In baptism, Lay people also, as I said, in case of emergencies can do it. 
in confirmation it's only the bishop and sometimes the bishop gives faculty or gives permission a mandate to a priest in certain cases to give the sacrament of confirmation in the sacrament of eucharist every validly ordained priest and then we have extraordinary ministers of holy communion we spoke about that but in the confessional my dear friends the only person who can sit in the confessional the confessor is a validly ordained priest so no permanent deacon no deacon can give you this uh, sacrament of penance it's only the validly ordained priest now even if that validly ordained priest the church law says by the fact of my ordination i cannot sit in the confessional the bishop must see me as a worthy person through my knowledge my life the theology that i'm able to express in the confessional the bishop should give me a special permission which is called a faculty which allows me to sit in the confession and to hear people's uh, problems and thereby give them the absolution the bishop also can limit to the places where i can go for example this is the diocese of bombay or any other diocese which you are watching the bishop or my superior will give me the permission to say i'm giving you the faculty to your confessions of only those who live in this diocese so just by ordination the priest cannot sit in the confession the priest the bishop has to give the priest this particular faculty if i don't have the faculty my dear friends the priest cannot sit in the confession and cannot absolve there can be some minor problems the priest who sits in the confession my dear friends has to remember two very important things as priests as seminarians we are taught about this but i would like you to also know what is the role of that priest who is sitting there in the person of christ as i said at the beginning it is not the priest who is forgiving sins because the priest does not have the power to forgive sins it is only god who has the power the priest therefore becomes a mediator of god and man sometimes i know people have expressed to us personally father I don't like to go to a particular priest in the confessional because how can he forgive sins he is also another lay person like me it is not god who is giving me the i say no it is god who gives you the forgiveness it is not the priest the priest is only an instrument who brings god's grace into your life in absolving and forgiving your sins so the priest there my dear friends is only a mediator between god and man he has been given the faculty to listen to the sin and the priest my dear friends is prepared for many years in the seminary to understand his work of holiness that means in dispensing the forgiveness of god the priest is reminded by the catechism of the church he says to him that as a priest you must be a good shepherd who goes in search of the lost sheep he must be like the uh, the good shepherd who not only goes in search of the sheep but like the good samaritan when somebody is wounded to heal the person he is also called to be like the prodigal son when he returns the pro- the father over there the generous father who is ready to lis- receive the son who had lost his way so the work of the priest is to heal and also to bring justice so the law of the church says the priest there is to be a judge as well as a divine healer so while his job is to understand the person in the confessional uh, uh, tell the person to explain his or her sin not just to judge whether the action is right or wrong but more importantly is to be in the person of christ there who is always merciful christ always showed mercy my dear friends he never rebuked people he never shunned people he never said i will punish you but those who came and confessed their sin the way christ operated and what we experienced the whole of last year that our god is god a god of mercy so the work of the priest is not to rebuke not to punish not to see the faults but the role of the priest is to be a loving father a merciful father who shares the merciful father's love like when the prodigal son returns who heals the wound of those who are wounded who are hurt so when you come to the confessional my dear friends do not feel frightened do not feel hurt do not feel pained that somebody is going to rebuke you somebody is going to push you out you may have some reservations about sometimes some priests but there are other priests to whom you can go and make your act of confession so the role of the priest my dear friends 
is to judge and see how to best listen to a person who is not confessional and provide some healing. Also, to grant God's grace of forgiveness. The priest is also cautioned, my dear friends, constantly not to be over strict in the way he sits and listens to the person in the confessional and neither to be too laxed. If one is too lax in the confessional, then the penitent says, Father, I have you know, failed in this and this and this. And the priest can say, it's okay now, you are a human being, it's fine, you just say one hour, Father, and help me and go away. Would it really help the penitent? Or would the priest see and say, oh, you did this, my gosh, you're terrible, you'll be damned. And you have done that, I did not expect this of you. And therefore, for penance, I'm going to give you A, B, C, D and burden the person in the confessional. That's not the role of the priest. The priest is reminded, not judge harshly, to judge and see where the fault lies and help the person to recover from his or her sinfulness. The confessional, my dear friends, the priest is reminded, is not a place for counseling. In the Middle Ages, sometimes the confession was seen as therapeutic. The priest is reminded the confession is a time, a moment for the penitent to express his or her sins. And sometimes the priest in his prudence could ask a few questions to understand where the penitent is. Not in order to make investigation there. Not to find the fault. Not to see the sin. But rather to help the penitent how best he or she can recover from the sin and experience the grace of God and God's forgiveness. Therefore, my dear friends, as I said, the sacrament of penance being such a vital moment for every penitent, the priest is reminded the sacramental moment is very sacred. And in reminding the priest of the sacredness, the priest, whatever he hears in the confession, whatever he hears, he cannot repeat it outside to anybody for whatsoever reason. He cannot. He cannot say, I met A or B or C in the confessional and he or she is struggling with this. Or I hear something about the penitent and I will go and complain to his or her parents or speak about the illness or the weakness of the person. The priest is forbidden completely. He cannot repeat it for whatsoever reason. There have been moments, my dear friends, when social agencies, civic agencies have tried to interfere with our sacramental life and have made sometimes laws which says the priest, if he hears something in the confessional, he has to report it to the police or to some civic agency. Under no circumstance, the priest is allowed to repeat whatsoever he hears in the confessional. And therefore, my dear friends, when you come to the confessional, come with faith and trust that you come to God to speak to him, to Christ. And the priest who listens to you will not use that information that you give to for whatsoever reason outside. Sometimes, you know, parishioner says, Father, you know, I know the priest. I know I'm going to be, a, I'm a catechist. I'm a parish council member. I'm a member involved with the Eucharistic ministry and so on. And if a priest learns about this, how will he deal with me? How will he respond with me? He will look at me and he'll judge me. He'll say he's such a good person outside, but internally he's broken. He's weak, he's sinful. It will be totally wrong on a part of the priest for any priest, my dear friends, who use this information outside the sacrament in dealing with any of you as parishioners. And therefore, my dear friends, it is a very sacred role. A priest cannot use any information he gathers outside. Sacrament of, the sacrament of penance is a very holy and sacred moment. As I said, it is a moment where you meet God, you meet Christ and you know that when you meet Christ, you've got to be present to him and in being present to him, you re receive his grace. The sacrament of penance takes place in the church because it is sacred. Sometimes we use places outside the church in the compound when there's a crowd. Sometimes some people say, Father, you know, I want to come outside the church timing. I want to sit across the table and make my confession. Many possibilities are there. The priest is reminded, however, my dear friends, to remember that any place that he may use for his confession becomes a sacred place. So, my dear friends, confession is to be done in a personal manner. Sometimes because of, you know, non-availability of a priest personally, or in this time of the pandemic, people phone up and say, Father, can I make my confession on the phone? 
The teaching of the church says no, it's a divine mandate that Christ says it must be a personal encounter. There are difficulties. You can be hacked on the internet. Somebody can listen to phone conversations, can be, re can be recorded. So in discussing with the Vatican has been very clear. You cannot have, you know, internet confessions or on the phone. It has to be a personal encounter with Christ. Coming to you, my dear friends, as a penitent, we all know that at First Holy Communion, you've got to make your first confession. At the age of seven, when you feel, uh, the, the church feels that uh, the person you reach age of reason, it's the time the person is ready to make his or her first confession. And from then onwards, you must visit the sacrament as often as possible. As I said, sacraments are moments of grace with God. We should not wait for Easter or for Christmas to make our confession. It's like carrying a load of sin. Some people say, but Father, I have not sinned. And uh, maybe pos it's possible that we don't introspect about our weaknesses. As I said, St. John Paul had said that sometimes people have forgotten what exactly is sin in our life. So I invite you, my dear friends, to come to the sacrament of, the, uh, of penance as often as possible. When you come to the confession, make sure that you talk about your sins and the number of times you sin. For example, if somebody says, Father, I slapped someone. But did you slap once or twice or thrice? And why did you slap? Or someone says, Father, I took something that did not belong to me. Did you take it once or more than once? So, you know, the whole idea is not to make an investigation, but for the priest to make an assessment because he's a judge to understand where you are in your sin. Why is it affecting you? Is there what ways you could use to remedy? And so therefore it's, it's required, my dear friends, that you come to the sacrament and talk to Jesus as you would speak to him. I can't finally, my dear friends, that all those who are baptized only can come to the sacrament of penance. There is a formula the priest would use at the end of the sacrament. And I like to quote it to you. It's there on your screen. The priest will say, God, the father of mercies, through the death and the resurrection of his son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace and I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So you see, my dear friends, the priest is absolving in Christ's name, not in his personal name, in the name of God himself. So that's with the sacrament of penance. Very quickly now, we look at the sacrament of anointing. As I said, two sacraments of healing, sacraments of forgiveness. In the past, my dear friends, even now sometimes we hear people come to and say, Father, somebody is seriously ill. We have to anoint the person. Some people still use that old usage word, extreme unction. Extreme unction means in the extreme sense of word to be used at the last moment of death. The sacrament of anointing, my dear friends, is not meant only for those who reach the moment of death. The sacrament of anointing, as the church teaches, can be administered to anyone when either because of old age or because of a serious illness or because that you know somebody is going for like a serious surgery or maybe on the point of death there can be various reasons why somebody should approach a family member and say please come and administer the sacrament of penance who can administer the sacrament of penance it's only a validly ordained priest so no deacon no seminarian, no layperson can, can anoint anyone with this oil for the sacrament of anointing. There are various oils used in the church for baptism. We use two oils, chrism oil and the oil of catechumen. In the sacrament of confirmation, we use one oil called the sacrament of catechumen, uh, cat chrism, chrism oil. And in the sacrament of anointing, my dear friends, only here, there is a very special oil which is used called the sacrament oil of infirmorium. Infirmorium is somebody who is sick. All these oils, my dear friends, are blessed, consecrated at a very special mass on Chrism Mass Day, the Thursday of Maundy Thursday. The Chrism oil is blessed for various sacraments. Catechumen oil is blessed for the sacrament of baptism. And infirmorium oil is blessed in order to anoint a person who is sick. At times, a priest, for whatsoever reason, may not have this oil available to him. The priest is allowed 
in an exigency, emergency, to bless the sacrament when it's being conducted. We know, my dear friends, that when somebody is sick, we believe that we recommend the suffering into the hands of the suffering Lord himself. And so the priest, in pronouncing the words of anointing, he anoints with his own hands. The priest cannot use, you know, ask somebody else, can you please anoint? I don't want to touch the sick person. There have been cases sometimes, there are people who are burnt or there is an accident case and you know, you can't anoint on the head. The law allows the priest to anoint on any other part of the body in these cases. But in anointing on the head and on the hands, there are certain prayers which are made, which I like to read to you. While anointing on the hand, the priest will say, May the Lord who frees you from sin, save you and raise you up. And on anointing on the head, the priest says, Through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So two things, uh, two parts of the body are anointed, the forehead and the hands. There is something that precedes this. We pay attention only to this anointing. But there is something that precedes this, the, the act of the priest laying his hands on the sick, just like Christ laid his hands on the sick and healed them. A part of this rite of anointing is when the priest lays his hand on the sick and prays that this person may revive, come back to good health. If you look at the various prayers for the sick, for those who are children, for those who are terminally ill, different types of prayers are there for those specifically suffering with major illnesses. So my dear friends, the sacrament of anointing is not to be misunderstood only at the time of death. The sacrament of anointing can be administered more than once. Just because you anointed once doesn't mean that's it. If the person gets sick again, either same illness or recovers and then gets sick again, you are obliged to call a priest. A priest is obligated in order to anoint someone who is sick. So my dear friends, you see, very briefly we have taken these two sacraments. Sacrament of forgiveness and sacrament of healing. Even in the sacrament of anointing, there is a healing taking place. Not just of the spirit, not just of the soul, but also we have seen cases when the sacrament of anointing is administered to a sick person, he or she has recovered to good health. We pray, my dear friends, that these two sacraments, what we have listened to, will encourage us to come to the sacraments. Don't be afraid. You go to meet Christ. You don't go to meet priest A or B or C. You don't go there for the priest to listen to you and judge you. It is the role of Christ to listen to you, to forgive you. I encourage you, my dear friends, visit the sacrament of the penance, not just because it's an obligation, not because you're forced, not just because the church has been telling you, but go there to meet Christ. You meet Christ, not only your sins are forgiven, but the church teaches us, you, re you receive grace from God not to sin again. You live a holier life. And for those who feel the need for anointing, your family members who are sick, going for a major surgery, when they are on the point of death, they are terminally ill, invite the priest into your home and get the person anointed. Thank you for listening. Have a pleasant evening with Father Robinson.
Today we had short insights into the canonical aspects of the sacrament of penance and anointing and heard how law brings healing and forgiveness in our lives and leads us closer to God. Every law of the church is to help us to grow in holiness. Dear brothers and sisters, we are confined to our homes due to travel restrictions and work from home rule. It's been months since we have met at the church. Although we are not able to be physically present in the church, distance cannot separate us from experiencing Christ in our hearts and in our homes. During the talk, we had reflected on the laws. Every law helps us to grow in His love. It becomes one of the instruments to experience Him. Psalm chapter 1 begins with an invitation to delight in the law of the Lord and meditate upon it day and night. For the next few minutes, we shall reflect and pray over our approach towards laws. Let us sing together Psalm 1. Let us compose ourselves to listen to the word of God. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us remain silent for a while and reflect.
the gospel clearly tells what jesus expects from us and what is the will of god that is fulfilling the laws so when we make efforts to fulfill the will of god in following all the instructions he helps us we are not alone when i am fulfilling god's will i am not working alone he works with us he is always with us he guides us as we sang in psalm 1 he guides us along the right path every rule every norm my dear brothers and sisters is for the good of the individual and for the good of the society as a whole we must remember jesus's approach towards the laws he says he had not come to abolish but to fulfill them at other places in the gospel jesus through his action shows us that we must follow the law according to its spirit not just stick to its letters that is the kind of life jesus is expecting from us sometimes we may get obsessed with the letters of the law rather than its spirit we do meet people like that am i like that do we have such kind of experiences in our lives let us call to mind those kinds of situation if we had acted just by the letters of the law then let us ask our lord to guide us on the right path and the ability to discern between the letter and the spirit of the law let us pray that we never compromise with the spirit if others had treated us without considering the spirit of the law and just by its letter then in our lives let us forgive them and pray for them in the silence of our hearts let us offer now our petitions to our lord our response after each petition will be loving father hear our prayer lord we pray for the upkeepers of the laws in our society that they may work for the well-being of the citizens our response loving father hear our prayer father we pray that we always experience your fatherly care through the sacraments of the church and receive the graces attached to each one of them for this we pray loving father hear our prayer lord we pray for all the families that are going through various struggles may they find strength in you to face them confidently our response loving father hear our prayer father we pray that the current situation may improve and we get to receive the sacraments especially the eucharist our response loving father hear our prayer in the silence of our hearts let us pray for our personal intentions our response loving father hear our prayer let us sum up all our prayers and petitions by reciting the beautiful prayer that jesus taught us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil let us pray god our loving father you alone are holy and good we trust in you and ask you to help us to live according to your will bless us 
so that we may always follow all the laws according to its spirit rather than its letter and grow in holiness we make this through christ our lord in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen the lord has done for